The Columbus Metropolitan Club was founded in 1976 by 13 women leaders who wanted to be included in the community conversation. I am Sally Bloomfield, and I was one of those 13 women. Having been left out of men's clubs that focused on community issues, it was a priority for us to make the club 100% inclusive. Today, CMC presents public policy forums every Wednesday at lunch with average attendance of more than 200 people. I'm Tony Bell and I frequently attend forums which are open to everyone and present relevant, current, and newsworthy topics. I'm grateful that CMC is nonpartisan and presents many perspectives on every topic. I'm Jane Scott, President and CEO of the Columbus Metropolitan Club. CMC is open to everyone to invite you to explore the personal and professional benefits awaiting you at the Metropolitan Club. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Welcome to CMC. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to the Columbus Metropolitan Club. Founded in 1976 by 13 visionary women leaders, CMC's mission is to connect people and ideas through community conversation. From its beginning, CMC has welcomed everyone. I'm Kelly Atkinson, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Director at Columbus and the Columbus Office Administrator at Barnes & Thornburg. I'm also the chair of CMC's Board of Trustees. So let's begin by meeting our newest CMC members. We have Clyde Compton with The Ohio State University Fisher College of Business, Robert Copeland with Equitas Health, Thomas Gott with Trusted Rides, Nala Key with the Columbus Zoo and Aquarium, John Ely with Heartland Industries, and Adrian Robbins with Strategic Public Partners. So let's welcome them to CMC. <laughs> All right, we also, of course, invite you to become a CMC member. So if you are wearing a red name tag, we can fix that for you. And we also invite your organization to become a CMC sponsor. On the back of your forum flyer, you can see all of the organizations that provide the not-for-profit Columbus Metropolitan Club with half of its annual revenue. To join this list of the very generous sponsors, please see Jane Scott, who's right over here, and Lainey Cuthbert, who's sitting at that table right back there. And they will help you to figure that part out. All right. Today's forum is sponsored by Porter Wright, Morris & Arthur, and The Ohio State University, with support from the Columbus Dispatch. Today's live stream is presented by the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. Let's thank all of those supporting today's forum. Okay, so Title IX. Part of a civil rights law passed in 1972, it changed the sports world forever. Title IX barred discrimination again based on sex in education programs that receive federal aid. Today, we will explore the legacy of 50 years of Title IX as CMC marks National Girls and Women in Sports Day with a panel of experts to unpack the, change, the changes from this landmark law on the world of sports. On behalf of today's sponsor, please welcome Michelle Wong Hallaby, partner with Porter Wright, Morris and Arthur to introduce today's panel. Michelle, the podium is yours. Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I am extremely grateful for the opportunity to introduce you to our distinguished panel of speakers across our, from across our great state. As an attorney, in the Porter Wright Sports Law Practice, it's an honor to sponsor today's event focused on Title IX and the incredible strides uh, we have made in gender equality in sports through the decades, especially as we celebrate National Girls and Women in Sports Day. We've come a long way, but of course there's much more work to do as we continue to level the playing field. I'm proud to be part of the diverse sports law team at Porter Wright, serving all athletes at the collegiate and professional levels. We routinely serve the complex needs of athletes and coaches as they progress through their various stages of their profession and uh, their career in sports. From contract review, career planning, estate planning, and asset protection to guidance with the use of their name, image, and likeness, 
we provide a well-rounded approach to counsel that allows them to plan for today and the future. Our job is to help protect athletes and maximize the positive impact they can have on themselves, their families, and their communities, both now and beyond their playing days. It's imperative that we always keep the best interests of the athletes in mind and maintain the right support system around them. Undoubtedly, I know each, of, each member of today's panel also keeps the best interests of athletes at heart. So let's get their conversation started. Uh, please welcome today's speakers. First, we have Dr. Kimberly Keel, Chief Operating Officer for the Ohio uh, High School Athletic, Athletic Association. <laughs> Next, we have Linda Logan, Executive Director of the Greater Columbus Sports Commission. <laughs> we have Janine Oman, Senior Deputy Director of Athletics for The Ohio State University. Don Stewart, Vice President for Student Affairs and Director of Athletics for Otterbein University. <laughs> and our host, Michael A. Race, sports columnist for the Columbus Dispatch. <laughs> you can learn more about uh, today's speakers from your forum flyer. Michael, we look forward to today's conversation. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin, but it made no mention of discrimination based on sex. Women were included in the Civil Rights Act only in Title VII, uh, an amendment that addressed equal employment opportunity, but did not apply to educational institutions, among other areas. Bernice Bunny Sandler, was among the precious few who noticed this. In 1969, Sandler, who was a part-time lecturer at the University of Maryland, applied for a tenure track position and was told she, quote, came on too strong for a woman. And are you gonna smile over here? <laughs> Within two years, uh, Sandler was working with Edith Green, who was a congresswoman from uh, Portland, Oregon, and uh, Patsy T. Mink of Hawaii, another congresswoman, to bring equal opportunity to educational institutions. They worked very quietly. They didn't really want anyone to know what they were doing. They thought there might be a stir, so they were rather surreptitious. Green slipped 37 words into an omnibus education bill that Mink introduced to the House and Birch Bayh of Indiana introduced to the Senate. The word sports was not among the 37 words that became Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. According to the esteemed sports writer Steve Wolf, who's written a lot about Title IX, uh, the only time sports came up was in the Senate hearings on the bill when one senator made a joke about co-ed football and, and then it was dropped. Richard Nixon signed the bill into law on June 23, 1972. In his signing statement, which is easy to find, uh, he made no mention of Title IX or of expanding educational access for women. Uh, he certainly didn't mention sports. Um, parenthetically, he talked a lot about busing. Sandler, that pushy professor, said, quote, the only thought I gave to sports was, oh, maybe now when a school holds its field day, there will be more activities for girls. The 37 words, Title IX, read as follows. No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied, be denied the benefits of, or be the subject, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. At the time Title IX was passed, girls were often barred from certain male-only courses, from calculus to shop to criminal justice. I know Kimberly has a, uh, has a calculus story for us. Um, law, medicine, so on. Uh, some U.S. colleges still refused to allow women to attend or had quotas for them, regardless of merit or qualifications. Others were denied tenure. Um, uh, 
others denied tenure to female professors or refused to hire them at all. So when we think of Title IX, we tend to think of sports, uh, and good re for good reasons. 1972, there were around 300,000 girls who participated in high school sports, according to the Equity Resource Foundation. Um, in 2019, that number is 3.5 million. In 1972, around 30,000 women competed in college sports in the United States. Uh, about 2% of college athletic budgets were dedicated to women's sports. Um, scholarships for women were virtually non-existent. In 2019, nearly 200,000 women were competing in college sports in the U.S. Um, and Janine could give you a very good idea of the scholarship opportunities. Um, it all started with one sentence in 37 words uh, 50 years ago. Um, Kimberly, you can tell us your calculus story. <laughs> And I also wanted to ask you what it was like. Um, you began, I think, your professional career as a college professor. Yeah. Um, what was it like for a woman to get a teaching job when you got to Ohio State? And do you have any, uh, w were there stories going around then of what, what it was like prior to your arrival at Ohio State? Um, yeah, so great question. Um, you know, the calculus story is that when I was a senior in high school, I graduated from high school in 1977 which was the year before Title IX became mandatory, right? So um, I loved calculus. Um, I was very good at it, and I loved it. And in about October of my senior year, my um, teacher, who I adored as well, uh, took me out in the hall, asked me to come out in the hall, and he told me that I needed to stop answering so many questions because I was making the boys look stupid and, and boys don't like girls who make them look stupid, which is about the worst thing you can say to a 17-year-old insecure girl. Um, so it, before that, I was thinking, I'm going to go major in math, and I did not major in math. Um, so I think you know the power that one sentence can have is really interesting. Um, when I was interviewing for uh, university positions, obviously, I went to Ohio State, so that was fantastic. But I also interviewed at um, another pretty prestigious university. Um, and when I got to the question and asked the dean about tenure and how tenure worked, his reply to me was, we're not going to discuss that now. You have young children. You probably aren't going to get there. <laughs> OK, I'm not coming here. <laughs> um, so I think you know there were still things in place that, that made it difficult. And that was not that long ago. That was in 1990. Of course, one of the threads we'll see here is this fight really never ends. Um, Kimberly, we'll stay with you, but I hope and I believe that uh, all of our panelists will weigh in here. Um, but uh, 10 years ago, upon the 40th anniversary, President Obama wrote about Title IX, and he wrote about um, equality for young people, how sports fostered a spirit of competition that helped girls and women succeed outside of the athletic forum. And uh, he noted that girls who play sports are, are most likely to excel in school. Mm -hmm. And I know at OHSAA you have a lot of, uh, probably have a lot of uh, uh, studies that, that show exactly that. Um, can you talk about this? And, and, you know, in my opinion, which counts nothing here, um, uh, this, this is kind of the heart of, of, of Title IX and as it's impacted sports, and it's probably best measured. I'm, I'm thinking or I'm asking, is it best measured um, through the numbers um, and the experiences of middle school girls and high school girls? Yeah, I mean, we at OHSA, obviously, we believe that, that we talk about student athletes. So we believe that athletics is really a vital part of a student experience and an academic experience for both boys and girls. Um, so I think, you know, what Title IX did was it opened those opportunities for those middle and high school girls. Um, and there are a lot of studies that show that kids who participate in athletics uh, do better in school, um, stick with things longer. There's all sorts of, of research that's out there. Um, you know, for us, I think we're always looking for those sort of new opportunities. You may have seen last week that we just added both boys volleyball and girls wrestling which um, is, is a two really emerging sports. Um, and we're loving that because it gives more kids more opportunities to participate and to reap those benefits. I'm sure anyone else on that one? I'll, I'll, I'll 
I'm in. Um, you know, just anecdotally, uh, building off of, of what she just mentioned, you know, what we see even at the small college level, it, we hear from our faculty on a regular basis. We hear from our staff that oversee student organizations outside of athletics that our student athletes are the leaders throughout campus. And, uh, and, and we have this tough conversation uh, around how to encourage them to balance their time and, and, you know, find the right time because you want them involved and, you know, build, continuing to build their leadership skills, not only on the court and on the field, but, you know, whether it's in the classroom, in a student government setting, wherever that might be, you want them to explore all of those things and have those opportunities. So it, it does manifest itself. Yeah. I think in, in our work, we have the privilege of working with so many different women around the community, around the country, and I think there's a great stat that 83% of women in the C-suite participated in some sort of athletic, whether it's high school, college, so those are staggering statistics. Um, the NCAA began pushing back against Title IX almost immediately. Um, it saw that it sees financial threats um, uh, when they're just uh, wisps of smoke on the horizon. Um, in 1974, uh, Senator John Tower, a Republican from Texas, um, introduced an amendment which sought to exempt revenue-producing sports from Title IX. Um, he was worried that funding girls' sports uh, would uh, would curtail prop the profits made by uh, for-profit sports in, in colleges. Um, the amendment was defeated. Um, I would note that uh, John Tower, some of you might remember him from the Tower Report, but he was um, also voted against the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act prior to attempting this amendment. In any case, um, Janine, can you punch some holes in Senator Tower's thinking? Um, and I'm sure, uh, it, which still persists in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm sure um, some of the other panelists uh, uh, would like to take a swing as well and can limber up. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one that, um, you know, I started high school in 77 and, and I was telling Mike, I uh, remember um, not, that was when we first started competing in the boys' leagues. So, um, 78 was when it was mandatory. So, um, I think I ran in maybe, if not the first, one of the first uh, Ohio high school state track meets uh, for girls. And so, I, I have great affinity that, um, and I'll piggyback on Linda's comment on the C-suite. So, the women that we have uh, that compete for us, um, you know, I think in one of my theories or one of my things to shut down that is um, we want to build a, you know, a DEI society where all voices are heard, right? And so this is a great opportunity uh, for these young women to develop leadership skills who become the future leaders, right? So sport is, you know, we always say it's a learning lab for life. And so they're gonna learn how to be on a team. They're gonna learn how to deal with conflict. They're gonna help, they're gonna learn ways to lead in a group dynamic, which is valuable in a business setting. And so when you wanna restrict that, you're saying the, only these people are worthy and they're getting that path to leadership. Um, and so uh, that plays out for us. I see one of our, our, our esteemed uh, athletes who's a graduate of, here, uh, of us, right? And what, what they've been able to accomplish. And so um, we feel very strongly, Gina, somebody feels very strongly that our men have the same opportunities as our women do and, and vice versa uh, for that. So that would probably be my one thing to, to take away. I, I, I sense that um, 50 years later, there's still some John Tower resentment of Title IX, if you will. Um, I suppose that when you poke at power like that and uh, stretch for equality that you'll have that when you're, I mean, you're kicking a hornet's nest, I guess. Yeah, I think that the one piece is it's really mindsets, right? So, uh, you know, cultural change doesn't occur overnight. So that takes time and I think people have to experience the, the good. So I think that, uh, you know, in for myself over my uh, 30, almost 35 years in college athletics, I mean, it, it's been amazing to watch the change. I used to be the only female many times in the room. I was a GA with a football team at North Carolina with Mac Brown, his first go route. Um, and so just the opportunities that you see for women, not only to play a sport, but to be involved at a professional level and, and have leadership roles at a professional level, that's gonna take time, right? So you just, it's one person at a time. How much calculus did Mac Brown know? <laughs> um, He's Linda, a great guy, though. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, I'd like to I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk about the Greater Columbus Sports Commission. 
Uh, this is an anniversary year for you. Um, can you give us the thumbnail of its origins, um, the ca calculations of uh, the financial impact, which you're so fond of giving on, on the area, and um, can you thumbnail uh, what percentage of that impact comes from non-men? So we are, think of us as sports tourism with three pillars, economic development, raising the image of profile of Columbus through sports, and then that quality of life piece of doing great things for our residents through sports. So when you think about some of the great events that have been in our community, even most recently, uh, where we've been able to showcase some of the highest ranking or highest competitions for girls and women, whether it's NCAA volleyball that was just here uh, a month ago or women's final four that was here a couple of years ago. You know, it took us a while to sort of build up to that reputation, but I think in our 20 year anniversary that we're celebrating also this June is that we've brought in over 500 new events, um, over a half a billion dollars worth of economic development, but it's more than just that. It's, it's just the role models of getting to meet Katie Smith or we have Celia Anderson from our staff that played in the Final Four at Arkansas, and, and she, you know, just being able to be around these great women so that the girls in our community, whether they're reading to the Final Four or they're watching these thrillers, these buzzer beaters, I think it creates memories for a lifetime. So I know we have that big economic number that we also tell, but I'm equally as proud of, of all the other things that we do as well. Ms. Linda raises uh, $300 billion a year for the greater Columbus area. Um, <laughs> next turn. Um, Dawn, you've worked at uh, both Division One and Division Three levels as an administrator. Um, uh, that's uh, only part of your background in association with women's sports. Um, this can go for each of our panelists, but uh, I'll put it to you first. Can you imagine life without Title IX? Oh, definitely not. <laughs> definitely not. I mean, having worked at both levels, and there's a little bit of a different philosophy in terms of how you're... Um, uh, I don't want to say supporting your student athletes, but how you're um, how you're investing in them, um, but you're in it for their success. So that doesn't matter what division you're at or, or where you are. You're in it to grow your student athletes. You're in it for them to become the best versions of themselves. You know, for them to become the best leaders they can be. And so, um, no, I can't. I can't imagine that because uh, our time would have been spent differently and and probably not as effectively either. Janine, they had to force basically your state to run a high school cross country state meet, right? Uh, Linda, your high school didn't have right. girl sports? So I graduated from high school in 73, right as the legislation was approved, but not really implemented. So we did not have any girls programs when I was there. So different opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Kimberly, do you have anything good? Yeah, I was in the same situation. I graduated in 77, um, and my high school, I come from a small upstate New York um, town, and my high school, I think, just decided that until it was mandatory, they were just going to pretend it didn't exist. So um, I didn't have those opportunities either. I could be a cheerleader. So, so Mike, can I, I'll add something for the, for the guys in the room. I, I have a distinct memory of my dad, because everybody had to do something in my family growing up. And uh, we were runners, and so I remember Dad's like, well, what are you going to do? I have a twin sister. And I said, well, Dad, there's no girls cross-country team. And I'll never forget this. He looked, well, I guess you ran with the boys. So we ran with the boys. <laughs> so I appreciate that. And so for, uh, uh, for the men in the audience, you know, encourage your daughters to, to really reach past what they think is um, the box that they should be in. There as well. I mean, I you know, I, so I was a child of the '80s, and um, you know, small town Ohio, and um, benefited from Title IX. So I guess to bring your your question full circle, mm -hmm. you know, athletics was one of my first memories. Wanting to you know compete with against my brother and play against my brother and beat him. I mean, that was one of my first you know competitive memories, and you know, and I credit him in a lot of ways for, for where I am today because it's been a driver of competitiveness and, and hunger and just wanting to grow and become you know, a leader myself, um, but then also wanting to pay that forward to your student athletes. So you know, I'm, I'm fortunate for, you know, for Title IX and for what's been done, but then also for the great minds and people around me, just like Janine said, that said, said yeah, go, go play, go compete with the boys. You can, you can do this. Uh, as a father of three girls among my brood, um, I'm so thrilled uh, that that uh, 
they can almost take it for granted. And that's a testament to generations of people uh, fighting for it. Um, and we'll get to the fight. Um, but Kimberly, you created the exhibit uh, uh, Ohio Champion of Sports while you were at, a, where you were a museum director at the Ohio St Historical Connection. As the exhibit came together, uh, did you have any epiphanies? Um, it's, it's like a Terry Gross bad question, but uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm curious about um, the arc of sports is history as it relates to women, because that, that was a project, that was a, it was a hell of an exhibit, but it was also yeah. an incredible project that, that came together <laughs> a long time. Um, for instance, um, the first OHSAA boys high school basketball tournament was in 1923, yeah. and the first um, girls high school basketball tournament was in 1976, yeah. Um, Hartley, by the way, won the first class double-A state title. Yeah. Are there any Hartley people in here? Yeah, yeah so, um, you know, it was interesting trying to create that exhibit. Um, you know, we wanted to be really thoughtful about having a nice balance um, in the exhibit. And there were some stories that jumped out. Katie's story, for example, jumped right out. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting to me and really eye-opening to me was how hard it was to find the stories of women's sports. Um, it was easy to find the men's sports. It was really difficult to find the women's sports and to find the women and to find the stories. Um, and we really had to do some digging and that was really eye-opening to me. The, the sports writers didn't do their job, this is what we're saying. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think that, that they just don't get as much attention in a lot of you know, even in high schools, they just don't get the kind of attention. And, you know, we have several major pro teams in the state, and I'm betting that hardly any of you could ever mention what the pro football, women's football team in the state, which is the winningest football team in the country, women's football team in the country, right? So we just don't hear those stories very often. And we tried to find those and put those in the exhibit, which is still there, by the way. The impetus behind us creating the Women's Sports Report, which was shining the spotlight on girls and women in Columbus mm -hmm. that really had not been recognized before. And really, the story was at a Christmas party in 2010. Um, I was talking to Barbara Fergus, who you all, many of you know, and three of our local teams were going to their version of their Final Four. It was Ohio State's field hockey team and soccer team, and um, I believe Otterbein's soccer team. And I, she said, I think you're the only person in the room that knows that, Linda. So how do we tell that story in a much broader sense? And so I think that really is something that has grown over time, and we still have a long way to go, but it's, that's, it's yeah. being ha having opportunity. Yeah, I'll piggyback. Um, for us in the um, Ohio State Athletic Hall of Fame, it is finding the stories of the women are, are really difficult. You know, those early women, it, it's uh, one that when you go through it, uh, the men, we have so many accolades and so many things, so it, we have to actively search um, to find the women uh, uh, in there, so yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, let's talk a little about the, the fight. Um, it, it's, Title IX is, is uh, like a rocket that continues to ascend through generations. Um, it's, it has a great symbolic heft to it at, at this point, 50 years on. Um, you know, a year after it was passed, uh, Billie Jean King founded the Women's Tennis Association and, and uh, pushed the fight for equal prize money for women. Um, and she intoned Title IX in 76. Um, the Yale Crew Team story, I know uh, um, folks who, who, uh, who read uh, Title IX history, this is, this is one of the stories that always uh, sticks out. The Yale Crew Team, they were tired of not having showers and waiting freezing on the bus for the men to shower. Um, so they, they, they stormed the athletic department, well, they didn't storm, they went into the athletic department and they stripped to the waist um, and they had uh, Title IX magic markered on both their front and their backs and um, that made it to the New York Times. Does that happen in the athletic department still, anything like that? <laughs> um, and in, 20, in 2007, uh, Venus Williams finally pushed Wimbledon for, for equal pay. Um, just two years ago, and it, uh, to my knowledge, the case is ongoing, um, the U.S. women's soccer team um, uh, stepped up their legal fight 
um, for, for, for equal pay with the U.S. men's team. And they're way better than, than the men's team, too. Um, um, but whether using a magic marker or, or yelling it from a mountaintop, um, women are still conjuring Title IX as almost a rallying cry. It's still, it's still that powerful. Is, it not, is there any way, and, and anyone can take this here, um, to, to quantify that? And, or, or how do you process that? I'll uh, speak for some of the work that we're doing. We, we host a, a lot of annual events in Columbus, as well as those one-offs that will come here. So we're kicking off celebrating all year. So we can have girls that come to our community or women that we're going to do some great content, maybe some educational things so that they'll learn about those 37 words. We'll t you know, so I think we're going to try to build on the legacy and then what's that next 50 years look like? I think the, you know, the best is yet to come. But I think that's at least some small way that each of us can do something. Same with our yeah. colleges. Say, Mike, um, it's interesting because our 18-year-old uh, female that comes to us is probably like your daughters. I don't know that they understand uh, the significance of Title IX and what it meant to them. Um, and so that's our plan for celebrating Title IX is they are now at a place where they take for granted a lot of the opportunities uh, that they have. So um, that's probably been one of the things that probably over the past five to ten years that I think I've noticed and in, in have because uh, in, it was just part of like if you grew up in that era, you just knew it and you knew what it meant. But I don't know for for current students, do they actually think about it in the same way that we do? Is it taught? Not yeah. directly unless you have a sports history class or, or something along those lines. But if you're speaking specifically to athletic programs, yeah. um, you know, I'll, I guess I'll take a step back. Here, here's what keeps coming to my mind as I listen to my wonderful colleagues and, and think about you know, our, our past is, is that leadership is, is such a critical component to all of this in the work that Linda does and the work that, you know, all of my colleagues do, as well as, you know, uh, our president is here at, from Otterbein and, and John talks frequently and acts frequently on equity. And so the importance of that, those conversations around equity, the importance of those actions around equity have to continue. And I think there's an opportunity there, which is what Janine's touching on too, for us to, to educate our students and our young people as to how this has evolved. Um, you know, and, it, and it's not just gender equity. I mean, it's equity in a lot of different ways and, and all ways. And so um, how, how does this conversation need to continue to go? And, and, and I think in a lot of ways challenging, once again, our young people to keep that conversation and those actions alive. I mean, to me, it should be part of history where you learn about the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, which was not too long ago gutted. Um, so we should fear for all of these things and hang on to them. But we, sh we should all be Billy Jean King is, I guess, one way to put it. Um, you know, uh, by the uh, early 90s, the, as, as uh, all of you guys know, the, the practice of, of universities cutting teams to meet Title IX requirements was becoming more common. Um, this practice has spiked precipitously as uh, American universities face uh, financial crises. Um, one thumbnail I saw was an expected $120 billion in negative, negative fiscal impact from COVID-19 um, uh, by the time the pandemic is done. Uh, more than 250 teams have been cut from athletic programs nationwide since 2019. Um, for, for Dawn and Janine, who can give us two different perspectives on this, uh, Division Three and Division One, respectively. Um, uh, the financial struggle is always there. Um, can you talk about this trend of, of some schools cutting teams just to say, well, uh, we need to get compliant? Um, one of you guys maybe can, can explain the three prongs of, of uh, Sure, uh, I'll, I'll take the three, three prongs of, you know, as with every federal law, there's compliance, right? So in athletics, when you look at gender equity, there's three ways that you can be compliant with it. Uh, the first way is probably the most typical in a Division I setting, which is proportionality. Okay, so from a proportionality perspective, that means our athletic opportunities have to match what our enrollment proportionality is male to female um, at Ohio State. 
Okay, so I can tell you at Ohio State, um, I'd like to say the female in me is when we became more selective in our admissions that we're growing closer to a 50-50 split. Um, but it's probably been not too long ago, maybe within eight years ago, that um, our makeup was about 54% male and 46% uh, female. So what that means for us at Ohio State is we have to find that sweet spot somewhere around 2% two, two or so where we're offering those same types of opportunities for uh, the men and the women. So when you see some of the cuts, right, there, there's two ways you can go about it. You can add sports or you can reduce sports. And so some will look at it from a proportionality perspective that they're like, um, as more schools are actually, I saw a, a paper, uh, an article the other day that um, they will expect over the next uh, few years, five to 10 years, that more women will be attending college than men will be. Um, and so that will skew the proportionality problem. Uh, that's there. Um, we're fortunate at Ohio State. Uh, we have probably the most broad-based program. Um, so we have, um, I think, 17 women's sports, 16 men's sports, and we have over 1,000 student athletes. Uh, so most schools will sponsor about 18 uh, sports. Um, and so, uh, you know, so that obviously adds to our budget, but we're fairly committed that this is part of their undergraduate experience and, and we feel strongly that we should do that. Um, but some people will use that proportionality prong. Um, <clears throat> another uh, prong that people will use, and we used it for many years at Ohio State, if you had a history of expanding women's sports opportunities, then you were meeting that, that prong. Uh, the third prong is that you're meeting interest of your students at the university. So I'm gonna turn it to Dawn, my colleague here, because that's a more typical way at a Division three model that yeah. you see. At the smaller school level, uh, generally we manage to that third, third prong, which is really getting a sense from your student body um, what the sport interests are out there and working to meet those sport interests. So practically at Otterbein, as well as other institutions that I've worked at, generally there's a survey that goes out, maybe it's annually, maybe it's every two to three years, um, that gets a sense from your student body as to where their interests are. And then this helps shape your conversations around adding sport programs. At Otterbein, our most recent ad was men's wrestling. And we did that about six years ago. And we did that really in support of what we were hearing from our student body. And, uh, and it's, it's been highly successful for us. But at the small school level, there again, uh, your, your student athletes, your sport programs, in large part are, uh, are enrollment drivers, are, are ways in which um, you are contributing to the admission of the institution. Um, so athletics is a partner to enrollment management, to the admissions program, and it's strategic in terms of how you're building your sport programs, what sports you're adding, where you're attracting students from, you know, that helps to all build the profile of your institution as well. Or, or does this at all apply to one of the largest high school associations in the country? Yeah, I mean, I think it applies to all the high school associations in the country, and I think it applies to high schools, too. I mean, the, the same thing that, that you hear at colleges, high schools are dealing with, um, and I think it was exacerbated by COVID as well. So do you add more sports and add to your budget, or do you take sports away in order to, to make sure you've got some equity there? Um, you know, for our associations, um, we don't get federal funds for the most part, so uh, we have a different relationship with Title IX. We follow it because we want to follow it and we believe in it, um, and we try to maintain that equity. So um, now, with the addition of the two sports, we have 14 girls sports and 14 boys sports that we sanction, um, and we try to pay attention to that as we go through. But it's definitely an issue in the high school still. Well, there was a recent case of Clemson Cross country, is anyone? They sued, the men sued after they actually, were Actually, the women actually um, were the ones who, uh, so uh, Clemson cut, um, I believe three men's sports. Um, so it was in the cross country. And so the women were very upset. So the women actually rallied the troops. So what ended up happening to meet their proportionality prong, they brought the men's sports back and then they added two women's sports so they could meet the proportionality. So they added women's lacrosse and women's gymnastics. It's equality can work, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, we're talking about federal law here all the compliance, um, federal bureaucracies, college bureaucracies, um, and we mentioned that uh, Title IX goes well beyond sports. I gotta stop hitting that thing. Um, 
uh, another realm of Title IX compliance um, is, is, uh, is gender-based discrimination, including sex-based violence uh, on campus. Um, there have been, this has been tweaked to be expanded under Obama, and um, uh, there were new directives put out in the Trump administration. Um, this is one of the more difficult things and, and something that hits the news quite a bit um, about college, um, the, their, uh, the imprimatur to handle this type of thing and um, the political football that it's become as well. Um, uh, Janine and Dawn, uh, it's, part of your, it's part of your life, is it not? And, and the good news is I'm looking at my staff here from our Office of Institutional Equity, who are our great partners in that. I think some of the lessons you learned from some institutions um, that didn't do that part of Title IX very well is they tried to manage that within their house um, and within athletics. So it's imperative for you to partner with your uh, campus institutions and campus uh, offices that this is the work they do. Um, and uh, because that's their space that they're in, we, we're in the gender equity space and providing from a sports perspective. So I think some of the more high profile sports you, or uh, cases you saw that they tried to handle it um, internally. For some time now, Otterbein has uh, spent time educating in this space. Our, our student athletes do regular programming, actually, and in our world, it's with uh, some of our faculty members from the Department of Health, Health and Sports Sciences who have specialties in, in teaching around spe uh, sexual violence. And re most recently, though, um, and it's been because of that ongoing work, uh, we've been awarded a, a $300,000 national grant um, to not only continue that work, but expand that education throughout the rest of our campus and throughout the community, too, um, so that our students can be advocates and can be leaders, you know, in that landscape. Yeah, and I think I would add um, as well, when you look at that, um, it's, this is where the Title IX uh, for, for our education pieces that we do with our students is for them to understand how it uh, broadly impacts all of those types of things. And so um, I think for them, uh, the discrimination free that you should be able to participate no matter if that's in a club sport, if that's a uh, varsity sport, if that's in a, a club, um, that this goes along with it. So we spend a lot of time in education. Um, you ask about what do we do educating about gender equity, uh, probably not as much as we should, but we spend a lot of time uh, with our partners in educating them uh, really in the sexual misconduct space and, and really um, because, uh, you know, I just think as you watch the evolution and, and what they're exposed to, I think uh, their definitions of what is okay may differ from what our definitions are. <laughs> Thank you, social media. <laughs> Um, we're, we're less than a minute here from, from taking questions from our live stream and in-person audience. If, if, if you have a question, you can step to the podium uh, with Doug now, make your way over there. Um, I, I just want to open it up if, to anyone who wants to add anything before we get to audience questions. Um, I'm sure everyone has something burning in their heart that they want to <laughs> express now. Open it up. We'll go right to questions then, Doug. Am I good? Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Michael, and thank you to our, our panel. I, I want to uh, just give a, a, a very quick moment of thanks. Uh, today's um, uh, forum topic, uh, the 50th anniversary of Title IX, was brought to our attention by Linda Logan. So, Linda, thank you very much for uh, reaching out to us and letting us know this is really something we should talk about. So, um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to take uh, our, our first question actually comes from, uh, it was pre-submitted before the forum. It's from um, Anne Gabriel, uh, retired from Ohio University. Anne said, or asked, Title IX requires equitable, not equal, treatment between the gender sports. What is the difference as you view it? It's a great question and one we struggle with. Um, I think uh, what we're looking at is people want to match this sport and that sport. What we're looking at is, is overall that we're providing an equitable opportunity for all that are there. So um, sometimes there's going to be gender-based differences that are, are, are legitimate. Uh, differences that are there. So we want to make sure that um, that's where the equitable pieces as we look broadly as to um, how we um, uh, employ that. I would add to that too, access 
it is typically the word and, and, and the action that, that we're kind of constantly thinking about in terms of, of equity is how are we providing access to our student athletes, um, you know, in the most equitable ways. Um, try to help coaches and athletic directors and others around the state um, understand this issue. There's a there's actually a drawing I use. So let's say you have a five foot person and a three foot person and you have a six foot fence, right? If you give both of them a one foot stool, the five foot person can now see over the fence, but the three foot person can't. That's, that's not equitable, right? <laughs> that's equal. So you have to give them what they need in order to succeed. And that visual seems to help people understand the difference between equal and equitable. Hi, I'm Carol McGuire. One of the most controversial topics um, out there right at the moment happens to be transgender women uh, participating in women's sports. Um, I wondered if any of you would care to comment. It's kind of a shame that I'm hitting you with this because it's a huge topic. Um, but I would like to hear what you have to say. We've actually um, been pretty active in that arena, um, opposing some of the legislation that's out there. We've had, um, since 2015, we've had 48 requests um, from students to participate um, with the gender that they identify with. 11 of those have been females that we've approved, um, eight middle school, three high school. No issues, no, no problems. Um, we feel pretty strongly, and we use medical basis to make those decisions. So we feel pretty strongly that they should be allowed to, to participate where they feel like they're most comfortable. The NCAA just has changed their stance on it. So for many years, they had um, where it's particularly from a, a male that uh, transitions to a female, uh, when you are looking at some of the hormones and things like that. So they had a pretty long standing policy. Um, and they actually have now pulled back that policy and are, are now deferring to each individual federated sport um, as to what their policy is and to allow competition on, on that level. Um, so we'll see how that plays out, but they, they actually affected that um, immediately. So for the next winter championships, those will be in effect. And I would just add once again that um, to me, this is where leadership is so needed and so necessary to continue such an important conversation and once again lead actions. I mean, I think, you know, Kim at the OHSA and her team, the work that they're doing, I mean, that's leadership right there. So um, just necessary. And I think I would add, uh, people tend to look at things from a competitive nature, right? So we tend to look at that um, from one way where there may be a competitive advantage. Um, we, we also have uh, students that there is no competitive advantage, so we can't lose sight, you know, of all of the conversations that need to occur. Down a notch mm -hmm. here for the five foot two person. Uh, my name is Leah Sellers. I'm a Gahanna based civil rights lawyer and activist. I had the good fortune of being trained by another pioneer in the field. Thank you, Michael, for noting all of those individuals. Professor Catherine McKinnon at that law school up north. McKinnon is a, a pioneer in, in the sister uh, civil rights code, Title VII. I'm a sports mom too. And so growing up, uh, I also wanted, wanted to mention Dr. Keel, small town, rural Ohio, that's where we're cheerleaders, right? But so was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, just so, just so you know. Um, Anyway, so I've taken on a number of these cases, right? I get calls all the time about Title IX and Title VII and, and lots of civil rights matters. We have to also note the intersectionality of discrimination and be sure that everyone's informed that it's all intersectional and informed in America by our race-based discrimination that we have. Uh, Dr. Keel, my question is mostly for you. So the conversations I have are with parents and coaches and ADs and everybody involved, uh, how, do we, how do we address these things that we still see and hear, right? I've called ADs, I've talked with tournament directors. I feel like I've educated as many people as I can, but some other people are gonna have to also take up the mantle. And I also think as civil rights litigators, we, we need to start litigating these cases. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, to, to an earlier point, you know, this is a 
culture shift, right? So as a culture shift, it has to come from all kinds of places and all kinds of sides. You know, as an organization, we're stepping up and trying to do something, um, trying to do more to help educate, um, particularly around that intersectionality. We're actually going to do a, a very first diversity summit for coaches, AD, superintendents um, in April of this year with some, some speakers that will be in to help them start to think through some of those issues. Um, but I do think, I think you probably will see, we're already seeing some more litigation happening. Um, and But I do think it has to come from all sides. It has to come from the college side, from Linda's types of organizations, from the National Association. Um, the National Federation of High Schools has done a lot of work around Title IX this year. I think they need to step up and do some more things. Um, so, yeah, to your point, I think it has to come from all over, and we have to just keep educating. Thank you. Our next uh, question is from the live stream audience. Alex Hackman asks, what are Ohio State's and the Big Ten's plans for women's wrestling, given the announcement of OSU women's club team and Iowa varsity women's team? Each individual institution has to make that. Uh, right now, I think there's one, maybe two Division I uh, programs. It is an emerging sport, so uh, for us, uh, we're pretty broad-based in where we're at right now at 36 sports. Um, so, uh, you know, it's one that we look at uh, sports as they come in and, and always evaluate that. Um, but uh, from a Big Ten perspective, um, uh, the minimum number of sponsorship is six. Uh, to, to be a Big Ten sport. Uh, so you would have to have a, an additional five join in for that to become a Big Ten sport. Um, and so uh, they're trying to build it right now. And there is to, you know, to Kim's point, you know, there's a lot of high school interest and that's important to us uh, that they have there. Um, but right now we're trying to, in the middle of COVID, maintain the 36 that we have. So. <laughs> Hi, um, I am an employee at Otterbein, um, so I get the pleasure of working with Dawn. Um, and I just had a question for you all um, with the talks of sort of the, the high dollar paid football coach um, and thinking about sort of the staff side of athletics. How, if at all, have you seen Title IX um, and that equity piece spill over into the staffing of athletics? Kelly, I'll slip you that 20 later for asking that question. <laughs> um, uh, that's a great question. I, I, what, I, what I'm taking from your question is balance. How do we balance all of that when you've got maybe a high and paid employee on your payroll and yet how does that impact the need for expansion of your staff and, and whatnot? I mean, I, 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 think our, I think it's more cultural. I, it's certainly Title IX has had a part in this part of the culture in that, but I think culturally as our perceptions and investment in athletics at every level has grown, that has grown then the investment at the collegiate level as well. Is that fair, Janine? Yes. Um, and, and certainly driven some of the demand for staffing and resources and investment uh, in your programs, ultimately driven by what is it that your program is doing for your institution. You know, as, as I spoke about earlier at a small school level, and this doesn't have to just be Division Three. this can also be small school Division Two, and, you know, others, even small Division Ones. you know, if, if athletics is a component of helping to drive enrollment and drive experience for your students, then you're going to really look holistically at what does it take to make that program work, and what's the kind of experience that you want to deliver through that sport program. Program. That's going to drive those types of decisions. Um, so, yeah, and I think the if you look back um, for when women, uh, you know, it's interesting. Um, so when you look back when women's sports started, the only people who coached women's sports were women because they didn't pay. Right. One of the saddest stats for me right now is there's never been a woman coach who's coached a national championship in women's volleyball. So we had a first this year, we had a regional, that there were four women's coaches that were coaching. And I'm proud to say we were one of them at Ohio State. Um, so I think that um, it speaks to, right, that um, what coaching women has, has become not just, uh, you know, in the 1970s or 80s, that that was a women's job. We weren't even going to pay you full time. 
right? So I think that uh, what we're seeing is an evolution, um, and, and so that we look at things from what is it that, I, I liked your comments about, like, what are you trying to accomplish and what do they need to get it done? And I go back to the equity and equitable, right? So we need to give them what they need and we need to pay them fairly for doing that. So I think we feel very strongly, but I think that's the, the, the good and the bad, I think a little bit from a Title IX is really in the women's coaching side. Um, that you were virtually 100% um, were all women's coaches. Um, to, that's not true today uh, for it. So I think you're seeing um, a lot of the women's coaches academies really coming back and really uh, pushing uh, females into those coaching roles. So. Yeah, I would say too in the, in the high school, um, the way I try to think about it, I have a big chart on my wall that shows all of our sports and where they sit as opposed to um, revenue neutral to revenue loss to revenue gain. You know, those sports that are paying more are also earning more. So we're a nonprofit. Um, we get no federal dollars. We earn all our ticket, our dollars, most of our dollars through ticket sales. So in my mind, those things in Ohio, it's football and basketball, both boys and girls basketball. Those sort of high income things are what lets us add girls wrestling and grow that sport. Um, so I always try to look at that balance financially um, as we go through. I hope we soon get to the day when um, women are coaching more men's teams and that it's more commonplace, you know, because there's a lot of talent that just just withers out there. We, we just, in, um, just in Ohio just recently had, um, we have a lot of, a lot more women officiating now too. Um, and we just a couple weeks ago had the very first time in Ohio where two women officiated a varsity men's basketball team. It's the first time it's ever happened. Well, they're in the NBA. Yeah. 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 So that I had a just anecdotally, I had a, uh, um, I'll give a shout out to our um, men's and women's cross country and track and field coach. So I have one head coach that oversees men's and women's cross country, indoor and outdoor track and field, and her name is Dara Ford. So female that oversees both men's and women's programs. And I had a conversation with a good colleague of mine, um, probably about five years ago, who made the comment to me. He said, you know, you're gonna need to, uh, to change that up and make sure that you put a male over your male program. Cause I just, I don't see that your male student athletes are gonna respond to Dara. And uh, back to back years, we've had top 10 teams in the, in the country, in cross country and, and uh, nationally ranked teams in, in track as well, or individuals in track as well. So I think Dara's figured it out. <laughs> and two, we, we have yeah. Karen Dennis, who is, uh, oversees both our men's and women's track and field. Well, that's a longstanding tradition for CMC to take audience questions and more recently live stream questions. Um, my work here is done, and uh, I'm going to step aside because I have no idea what to do next. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>I hope that you all enjoyed the forum as much as I did. I have four kids in sports, so I care so much about this, and two of them are daughters, and I just, I so appreciate everything that you all do, and just that really so many people do in our community to help them to be able to do all this, so thank you for being here for all of that. Um, please make plans to join us next week as CMC presents Chasing the Promise of Equitable Education, featuring another panel of experts. Thank you to our sponsors, Porter Wright Morrison Arthur and The Ohio State University. And thank you to the Columbus Dispatch for supporting today's forum. Also, thank you to the online virtual seat patrons and to the Emergency Response Fund of the Columbus Foundation for presenting our live stream in partnership with the Columbus Dispatch. And our special appreciation for today's speakers, Kimberly Keel, Linda Logan, Janine Oman, Don Stewart, and our host, Michael A. Ray. So let's just clap for them real quick because I love them. <laughs> All right. And of course, thank you all for joining us. We couldn't do it without you, and we look forward to seeing you next week as the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents another community conversation. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs> and don't get sports. Sports. Uh, so